Good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's afternoon here um, as I'm recording live at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara, California. Um, it's such a pleasure to be with you today. I want to thank your professor, Paul Blankenship, a dear friend of mine, for inviting me uh, to speak with you a little bit today about emerging spiritualities uh, and particularly their manifestation in comic books and graphic novels today. So I'm gonna be working from a prepared text um, and also a PowerPoint. So if you um, sort of see me looking down or, or um, sort of not always making eye contact, it's because I'm, I'm, I'm working from, uh, I'm working from a, my notes here on the computer. And the entire um, presentation has a PowerPoint so that will enable me to uh, hide a little bit off screen here and hopefully draw your attention to the images um, that you will see. Okay, so um, let me share my screen. And here we are with our title page, the comic book as mystical text trauma initiation and the empowered imagination in Grant Morrison's The Invisibles. Just a little bit of a brief introduction. Um, let's go back a bit. So we're gonna be talking about a, a contemporary comic book author who's been active over the last, wow, really four decades, four or five decades um, named Grant Morrison. Um, Grant Morrison is one of the comic book industry's most acclaimed authors. His use of visionary, mystical, and explicitly Gnostic and esoteric cosmologies in his stories and plot lines has consistently pushed and defined the boundaries of what a comic book is, how it can be read, and most relevant here, comic books' potential for conveying and even transmitting revelatory, epistemological, and ontological truths. In other words, in Morrison's hands, the comic book serves as a catalyst for visionary experience, or more aptly put, mutates the comic book into a mystical text. My aims here are threefold. First, to outline a brief history of what religious studies scholars Jeffrey Kripal and Jess Hollenbach refer to as empowered imaginal experience. Second, to offer two imaginal case studies that I feel demonstrate the efficacy of the empowered religious imagination at work, including its manifestation by means of trauma and initiation. And finally, to draw conclusions regarding the nature of empowered imaginal experience, not only for the author in question and the comic book characters he creates, but also, more importantly, the ways in which such empowered means of knowing are transmitted to the reader slash initiate. In other words, me and you. So I'd like to begin here with a brief genealogy of imaginal experience. And this might be a, a term that's uh, relatively new for you maybe. So I'm, I'm summarizing and borrowing um, and slightly redacting the work of Jeff Kripal here who offers a, a similar outline in his book, Secret Body. Um, which, which might be of interest to you. So with this genealogy, I wish to highlight the ways in which the term imaginal has been used historically. Interestingly, first by psychical researchers, psychical researchers were um, early turn of the century, Victorian era researchers into the paranormal and the occult and spiritualism and uh, mediumship and communicating with ancestors, communicating with the dead. Um, so, in, so yeah, so used first by psychical researchers and early depth psychologists, such as Frederick Myers, Theodore Flournois, and C.G. Jung, in attempting to understand the imaginal quote-unquote superpowers of mediums and their secondary selves, in other words, their alters or their um, multiple or altered states of states of consciousness that that trans mediums would enter into to communicate with other realms. 
So these early, early depth psychologists and theorists of the paranormal um, were studying these trance mediums um, as well as the symbols and the images and the dreams that would emerge from their altered states. Right? So this was, this was prior to the idea of an unconscious. The, the idea of the unconscious sort of came out of this research tradition. And then um, later, some of you might know the work of um, the uh, scholar of Islamic mysticism, Henri Corbin. Um, and in his study of the Sufi mystic Ibn Arabi, and um, what he refers to there as the creative imagination or the mundus imaginalis, the imaginal world. And so that's another aspect of this, this, uh, this sort of tradition of the imaginal. Um, and then more contemporary, the archetypal psychologist, James Hillman, who, who uh, was sort of a third generation uh, Jungian scholar and analyst. Um, and he bases his entire understanding of the unconscious on um, what he calls the imaginal um, or the poetic basis of mind. So, not sure if that's entirely clear, but I'm really basing this presentation today on this concept of the imaginal. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a little bit deeper into that, a, a few more definitions to help you get maybe more of a concrete understanding of this idea. We're not quite talking about the imagination that many of us think of the imagination. When many of these, these scholars talk about the imaginal, they're actually talking about, um, you can see the quote here from Henri Corbin, uh, the imaginal as a noetic organ, right? So an organ of the mind that accesses a real dimension of reality, what he calls the intermediate world of the mundus imaginalis, right? So this is more than imagination in the sense that we think of maybe like children's use of imagination in play. Um, according to many of these scholars, the imaginal is actually a part of the unconscious that is how we access the divine. It's through the imaginal, all right? Or later, what we're going to see, the empowered imaginal or the empowered imagination. That's actually the space, the intersection or the space um, where the human and the divine meet or where the divine breaks through into the human. Okay. So I wanna make two more distinctions here. And this is, again, based on the work of Jeff Kripal. Um, and here's an image of his book, The Secret Body. So Kripal adds his own specific branches to this imaginal family tree. He makes a distinction between an empirical and a symbolic imaginal. What does he mean by these terms? The empirical imaginal refers to what we would call today evidence-based knowledge resulting from visionary or altered states of consciousness. An example of that would be something like precognitive dreams. So in, think about the term empirical or empiricism, something that we know that can be true or validated in this sort of external material reality. And right? so there's a material historical realism, right? or having some sort of daydreams about something that then comes true in, in, in the world. Right? These are states of consciousness with the ability to manifest or predict historical events, right? in what we commonly refer to as real time or the material world. The symbolic imaginal is what I am more interested in here in this presentation, as it points toward the kind of experience that Jung considered archetypal. Um, for those of you that are familiar with his concept of synchronicity, it's um, sort of a, a way that the inner and the outer uh, connect with one another, uh, the psyche and um, nature, for example, the way that we can um, see uh, the way that, um, sorry, I'm just losing track here. Um, the way that symbol and image um, can mediate some other kind of world or hidden reality. Um, so whether in dreams, revelations, or empowered, symbolic, or visionary awakenings, these types of experiences mediate another world and act as ciphers of some other form of mind. Here is where Jeff Kripal 
uses Henri Corbin's concept of the imagination as an organ of revelation. And this is also where I locate our illustrated comic book material today. So two examples from the world of art history, just to sort of demonstrate each. Uh, the first here would be a more realistic example uh, of an empirical imaginal. You see a woman here um, having a dream and in the dream there's some sort of re realistic encounter that's happening. It looks like she's having some sort of meeting with maybe her father or um, it's kind of kind of hard to tell, but you can notice the dog and the, the the boy or the child outside the window. There's a certain material realism to the artistic style here. Whereas with the symbolic imaginal, you can see the Chagall image on the right. Um, there's more of a mediating capacity. There's more of a of an inner dimension and and this sort of mediating between the two. You can see the ladder here. Um, mediating symbolic of mediating between realms the the place where the inner and the outer might meet that is my sort of analogy of Jung's idea of synchronicity now what is this idea of empowerment this is again from a scholar jess hollenbeck's work he defines empowerment as a radical enhancement of the imagination right, including thought or emotion or will that often emerges when the mystic tightly focuses attention by a practice of recollection. So recollection is a way of bringing all of these different aspects of the mind, concentrating them together and focusing. Empowered inactions are filled with noetic possibilities. So sort of uh, altered forms of mind, right? uh, forms of gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, gnosis direct ways of knowing. Um, so the imagination itself transforms or mutates into a super sensory organ of perception, communication, and knowledge. There's a form of transmission at work in empowered imaginal experience. And Hollenbach offers two case studies um, of, of texts or experiences you might be aware of um, exemplifying empowered recollection or empowered imaginal mystical experiences which lead to some form of supernatural perception. The first in the story of Black Elk, which you can see on the left, one of Black Elk's visions, and then also Teresa of Avila. Um, and here's the famous Bernini sculpture from the 16th century of, of Cupid, um, Eros piercing her with divine love. Now, this takes us to the concept of the empowered imagination itself. Both Kripal and Hollenbach use this term. So let me read to you first from Kripal, who articulates these states as consisting of such special moments when the imagination is electrified, zapped, or magnetized, and it just knows. What is known or seen in such special states remains imagined, but it is now experienced as somehow more real or more true. The empowered religious imagination is no longer simply constructing and projecting. It is now also mediating and translating. And in some quite extraordinary cases, even apparently materializing, it's fantastic content. In a phrase, something is coming through. And this something is both real and imagined. And so Kripal is having fun here and playing with our, our duality or our construct of what we consider as real or as imagination. He's saying it sometimes or oftentimes in mystical experience or in spirituality, it's oftentimes both. It's both real and it's also imagined in the sense that it's being filtered or somehow being transmitted through the imaginal or the imaginative capacities of the mind in this sort of empowered state. So in other words, these moments of empowerment we move from imagination per se, for example, just like daydreaming or reverie, towards the imagination as an organ of revelation. For example, um, the Prophet Muhammad um, reading, receiving his revelation um, from the angel Gabriel. And so there's a distinction here between something like daydreaming or the ways that we can imagine certain creative projects or imagine what we want to do with our day versus something breaking through our imagination in a form of divine um, or spiritual revelation. 
Next piece I want to talk about here is around trauma. I know that, that um, you've done some work on this area in class. So I want to talk about this idea of trauma and transcendence, um, which is also uh, borrowing from the work of Jeff Kripal. So I want to allow, um, I want to add one more layer to our, our interpretation here. So if we can assume that empowerment is an inherently noetic or mystical capacity of the psyche, trauma becomes one such possible opening. For Kripal, trauma serves as a potential catalyst for empowered imaginal experience. And he reminds us that whether as a physical or psychological wound, trauma can serve as an opening. To Kripal, trauma, it seems, is what electrifies, zaps, or magnetizes, and hence empowers the imagination. Now, he's not trying to glorify in any way trauma here. He's actually speaking to the more um, numinous or mysterious or sometimes sacred dimensions that trauma can serve as an opening. And I have these two images from his books here because in each of these books he co-wrote with someone who had a near-death experience. Um, in the case of Whitley Strieber, uh, it was a acclaimed UFO abduction experience. And in the book on the right that he co-wrote with Elizabeth Crone, she was struck by lightning, had a, a near-death experience that she, she it felt like was, was two weeks long, but in reality was, was maybe two minutes. Um, and she had an experience of being in the afterlife, speaking with, um, I believe, her deceased grandfather. So there's a way that physical trauma and also emotional trauma um, can serve as an opening into certain altered states of consciousness um, or non-ordinary states or emergent forms of spirituality. So the important thing here is that this alter, the altered state of consciousness appears to be let in through the temporary suppression or dissolution of the socialized ego. So that's the you or the I that I experience as my everyday self. Right? And some of us, you know, depending on how hardwired or socialized we are, cling really hard to that ego and how we define ourselves. Um, and sometimes it takes traumatic moments or traumatic experiences of loss to, to oftentimes transform or open up our egos to these sort of transcendent states. So this is what he means by this idea of trauma and transcendent, or what he also calls the traumatic secret. So the trauma here is the trigger, but not necessarily the cause. So it's non-reductive, right, which is also really important. Now, this comes from Kripal's own empowered imaginal experience, what he refers to as uh, that night, with a capital T and a capital N, that night. So this was, um, this was an experience that Jeff Kripal had in Calcutta, where he, um, he claims to have been visited by uh, a very powerful energy in the form of the goddess Kali. And this experience was actually um, uh, narrated and, and visual, visualized or encoded in comic book form, and these pages are found in his book, uh, Secret Body. So this further amplifies Kripal's own thesis in another one of his books, called Mutants and Mystics, that comic books and popular culture serve and have served as a medium for repressed or marginalized religious, occult, and paranormal phenomena including the varieties of emerging re-enchanted spiritualities of which Christopher Partridge has termed popular occulture. And so that's the ways in which the occult or the paranormal or these sort of alternate emerging spiritualities that are non-normative or not mainstream oftentimes will appear in our pop culture um, in the sort of collective. Right. Okay, now to move to the main piece today. Grant Morrison, uh, Grant Morrison, by the way, was just for some context, was born in uh, 1960. Uh, he's a Scottish, um, Scottish uh, author. Uh, he's known for uh, more of his writing. He, uh, then he's not an illustrator, he works with other illustrators. He's written a lot of famous, very popular series. Um, he's worked on Batman, Superman, the X-Men. Um, and then, of course, he has his own created cast of characters. 
He's also inspired um, a number of Hollywood films, including the early X-Men remake from the, the 2000s. Um, he's also worked on uh, Happy, he, which was a, based on a novel that he wrote. And um, just this week, uh, Brave New World came out and um, on, I think, NBC and Grant Morrison, I think, was one of the producers or co-writers for that series as well. So he's been very, very busy in um, both comic books um, as well as film and, and television. Uh, his Doom Patrol was also recently turned into a series. So one of the things about Morrison's characters, particularly his early work from the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s, is that they are just completely imbued with, um, they're almost like Gnostic superheroes. They're not superheroes in the normal sense of the word, particularly in his work, The Invisibles, where they're clearly, um, these are characters that have trained in uh, tantric yoga and um, martial arts, meditation practices, um, Tibetan Buddhism, um, the tarot, all sorts of uh, psychedelic experiences, um, mushrooms, LSD, all sorts of varieties of spiritual technologies come into play here in Morrison's characters, and that's where they gain uh, their superpowers, which, as I mentioned, are more a form of gnosis um, than they are sort of um, any sort of born, uh, like, you know, flying or, or shooting rays from their eyes or something. These are very, very different kind of spiritual um, superheroes. So, um, yeah, a little bit more about the Invisibles. So the Invisibles, um, Morrison, Morrison's Invisibles ran from 1994 to 2000. And they question the very nature of the superhero genre and of reality itself. Revisioning his team, not as caped crusaders, but as I mentioned, as Gnostic heroes on a cosmological battle against evil archons, intent on a hostile takeover of the planet through total sub subjugation and control of the human species. Morrison describes the Invisibles as a magic spell in comic book form that would have the power to change lives. In other words, a comic book as a mystical text a psychedelic trip, a revelatory vision in paperback form, steeped in empowered, imaginal, comparative, mystical material. If the fourth dimension represents the hidden, the occult, and the repressed, with Grant Morrison, we enter the fifth dimension, the empowered imagination. Now, in order to do battle with these forces of cosmic darkness, or more often than not, while at the mercy of them, the Invisibles team undergoes a variety of traumatic yet revelatory initiatory experiences. And I want to focus here on two in particular. The first is Lord Fanny. Lord Fanny is a shamanic transgendered prostitute who, as a young male child, undergoes an initiatory rite of passage in Mexican shamanism as a female. And through a traumatic encounter with death, emerges twice born, in other words, as an initiate or initiated. She's pictured here as a young male child named Hilda. And the narrator tells us that with no daughter in the family to inherit the knowledge and power of the Nauli, her, her people, what else could the women do? Hilda will have to become a girl, grandmother tells us. Young Hilda is then taken to the jungle offered some witch's brew, which transports him to an imaginal empowered landscape and serves as the set and setting for his traumatic initiatory journey. Hilda then unwillingly succumbs to the symbolic ritual castration where grandmother slices his upper thigh to mimic menstruation. Hilda awakens to that most pregnant symbol of transformation, the butterfly, who verbally reveals to her the true nature of the space-time continuum. All times are the same time. A true initiation takes place outside of time. For, for those of you that know your ritual theory, um, this might be something that you're familiar with, how 
uh, ritual initiation often happens in the liminal space, the, this pla the place that's in the space that's in between time. She then journeys to the land of the dead, converses with death, and then travels beyond to a Gnostic Garden of Eden, where, through a self-inflicted ritualistic and symbolic trauma, a piercing of the tongue, Hilda learns the secret common language of shamans, the tree itself affirming and blessing, authenticating her womanhood. Hilda is granted a vision of her past and future, including further shamanic initiation into the uses of ectoplasm. Ectoplasm, many of you probably know this from the Ghostbusters movie, um, but ectoplasm was a phenomenon that early spiritualists um, in seances and in trances would, would manifest this material form coming out of their mouths. Hilda then returns to where she began, a symbolic imaginal encounter with the butterfly and asks, then is my initiation over or has it just begun? And the potent reminder that nothing begins, nor does it end. Things are ever present, only to be reborn. In our second empowered imaginal initiation, we find young invisible Jack Frost confronted with an especially dark and insidious archon. The, the archons, for those of you that know your Gnostic uh, cosmology, the archons are sort of these dark evil powers. Here, Jack draws a magic circle around himself and enters into a deep meditative state where the archon looms, coaxing and tempting him towards despair via memories of Frost's traumatic and fragmented past. Initiation serves as an archetypal confrontation with the unconscious. That's a phrase from uh, C.G. Jung's Mem Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Uh, perhaps familiar to contemplative practitioners and students of the depth psychological. Jack describes the Archon's destructive and seductive pool as every shitty thing you've done, every horrible, sick thought you've ever had. They turn it back on you until you can't think of anything else. They can break your heart and shit on your soul. As part of his inward journey into personal and archetypal shadow, Jack is given a vision of his death. He comes to face his own mortality and through an empowered imaginal landscape meditates on his own grave, which is, which is certainly a, a, a yogic uh, tantric practice. Of meditating on death. You see this also in the Tibetan Buddhist traditions. All of his inner demons are thrown at him, personified, visualized, externalized, powerful aspects of the symbolic, imaginal, and negative form. Again, familiar to students of contemplative disciplines and comparative ascetical and mystical practices. Um, this image on the right is of Saint Anthony of Egypt, um, and his torment being tortured by his own personified demons. By not surrendering or believing any of these various temptations, however, Jack breaks through. You can see here, that's when it happened. And he receives a powerful mystical spiritual download, an empowered initiation into eso esoteric forms of knowledge. Similar to young Hilda and the butterfly encounter, Jack reveals, I knew by heart the DNA codes of starfish and giraffes and people from Sri Lanka. I knew the third word on page 14 of the cat in the hat, and it was fear. I knew who killed Professor Plum in the kitchen with the fucking revolver. I was watching all of space and time, the whole universe from the beginning to the end, and it was all just falling into itself and going away. And finally, the apotheosis. And I was home. I was God looking at myself in the mirror. I was perfect in eternity. So I wanna offer some comparative conclusions here. The previous examples highlight the role of initiatory practices in the invisibles as a form of imaginal regeneration and second birth resulting in a form of empowered knowing. Mystical truth revealed to the initiate through traumatic injury 
confrontation with unconscious traumatic memory or near-death experience. I'd like to conclude by theorizing a dual reflexivity inherent in Morrison's Invisibles. Such graphically depicted gnosis serves as a double revelation, imparting hidden knowledge not only to the characters in question, but through each character transmitted directly to the reader. In other words, an empowered imaginal that simultaneously empowers the imaginations of its readers. A catalyst for the reader's own initiation into revelation through empowered image and text. I'd like to further suggest that it is precisely because these case studies presented here are based, at least in part, on Mer Morrison's own personal autobiographical spiritual and mystical experiences. In other words, he writes himself onto the page of his own comic books, that Morrison's texts function as a form of empowerment or empowered knowing for the reader. In other words, it is Morrison's own empowered imagination that produces empowered texts, which further produces or ignites empowered readers, a three-way hermeneutical union of empowered imagination operating through graphically depicted visual and visionary experience, a Mobius strip of mystical unknowing, and a Gadamerian overflow into an Ouroboric excess of meaning. I'm being a little clever there, but if you, those of you that know the work of, of Gadamer, um, his idea of the excess of meaning is when, uh, when two different texts or traditions or people come together and, and um, the horizon of the reader and the horizon, the horizon of the reader meets the horizon of the text and these two horizons sort of create what he calls an excess of meaning. Now, I think that this is what we see in the history of comparative mysticism. For example, in the imaginal illustrations of, this is the image on the left, uh, 14th century Henry Suso and 16th century John of the Cross. Um, John, this is one of the few, if not the only sketches that we have from John of the Cross, whose own empowered visual pedagogy served as a form of transmission for future imaginal empowerment. So in the case of the Henry Suso's text here, these images um, that he drew were, um, were didactic or pedagogical. So it's, it's, but they came from his own mystical experience. So he receives a mystical experience or spiritual download that then becomes illustrated and turned into a book form to, to sort of create or transmit that to, to future empowered mystics, right? So imaginal experience produces imaginal experience in the reader. And this is something that we, we definitely see um, across religious cultures, for example, deity visualization in Tibetan Buddhist Tantra. And again, we have the empowered imagination really on uh, full force here. Um, tantric traditions, both in Tibet um, and in uh, South Asian yogic traditions are, are based on this idea of even creating these kinds of empowered imaginal states. They work with the imagination, but they do it in a way that attempts to create or cultivate some sort of mystical state or breakthrough um, into a non-ordinary awareness or consciousness. Morrison's work thus serves as a potent catalyst for his reader's own empowered recognition of their superpowered, gnostically charged potential. It is through the narrative journey of trauma, healing, and awakening to one's true supernature that Morrison's The Invisibles both transmit hidden knowledge and mutate the reader into a living, embodied, and empowered mystical text. Right. So I'm gonna uh, close the formal presentation there. Uh, normally we would have some time for some questions, but what I wanna suggest to you, or what I wanna sort of encourage you to think about is, what does this have to say to emerging and contemporary spiritualities today? Um, we're, we're looking, we're outside of a specific um, Christian milieu, although there's certainly Christian material here, and we're in more of a comparative spirituality. So we're looking at uh, 
Buddhist practices, we're looking at indigenous shamanic traditions, but they certainly have themes and resonances with theme with um, the Christian tradition, um, and Jewish mystical traditions of ascent. Um, so there's a lot of comparative work here too. And then of course it's contemporary. This is something that, um, uh, this is a, a body of knowledge that was was coded and encoded and constructed and, and written and, and drawn um, at the turn of the 21st century. And I think speaks to the turn in comparative um, in, in our current culture and society of this, this, this idea of a spiritual but not religious movement or the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. So people that have no religious affiliation but feel very drawn towards the transformative um, capacities in, in emerging spiritualities. So I think Morrison's work is, is firmly in, in along that line and, and that's really who the, the authorship and his reader, the readership that he, he really um, appeals to. So I guess for your reflection or, you, or, or, or discussion among, among the class or, or, with, um, or with Paul, maybe just think about some ideas of like, what does this say about contemporary spirituality? What kinds of spiritualities are emerging in the culture today? Um, and what is it about this sort of this um, first person desire for first person experience around initiation or, or desire for breakthrough experiences into alternate states of consciousness? What does that say about um, contemporary spiritual seekers today? So I will stop sharing. And uh, I think I'm going to conclude here. And I just want to thank you again for your time and really um, appreciate your interest. And, and thank you again for Paul for the invitation to speak. And maybe someday we can have more of a live uh, interaction. Okay. Blessings to all of you.